being in a good mood is really great. And most languages have lots of words to describe the experience, like happy, cheerful, joyful, and so on. The same goes for the languages of the Bible. In ancient biblical Hebrew, there's a variety of words, like simcha, sason, or gil. In the Greek New Testament, there's kara, euphersune, or agaliasis. Each word has its own unique nuance, but they all basically refer to the feeling of joy and happiness. Now, what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing the kinds of things that bring happiness, and also seeing how joy is a key theme that runs through the whole story of the Bible. Let's start with sources of joy. On page one of the Bible, God says that this world is very good. And so naturally, people find joy in beautiful and good things of life, like growing flocks or an abundant harvest on the hills. The poet of Psalm 104 says a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to people's hearts. People find joy at a wedding or in their children. There's even a Hebrew proverb that compares the joy that perfume brings to your nose with the joy a good friend brings to your heart. However, human history isn't just a joy fest. The biblical story shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss. And this is where biblical faith offers a unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. So when the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing the Israelites did was sing for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, they were vulnerable, the promised land was still far away, they rejoiced anyway. Later biblical poets looked back on this story and they remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. This joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment, a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This theme appears later in Israel's story, when Israel suffered under the oppression of foreign empires. The prophet Isaiah looked for a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites waited, they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. This is why it's significant that when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news that brings great joy. We're told that Jesus himself rejoiced and gave thanks to God his Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He even taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness, saying, when people reject you or persecute you for following me, rejoice, be very glad, because your reward is great in heaven. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was the risen king of the world. And as they did so, the early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus that his loss wouldn't be the final word. This is very different from the trite advice to turn that frown upside down. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And that's what biblical joy is all about. Man, he's so good. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Man, I, that last song, if that didn't get you excited, hopefully my Christmas tie does, but, uh, but it is the Sunday before Christmas and uh, all through the house. No, I'm kidding. But um, we, we should be excited. This is the happiest time of year, and yet there seems to be a, a shortage of joy. At first glance, it's like, well, why? I mean, things are great. I mean, technology's never been better. I mean, we can ask Alexa or Siri to do anything. I mean, you can ask it, well, besides raise our kids, but we got Zoom for that, right? But um, there's, and and how about camping? Like, it's it's wintertime, but we can go camping. You've heard me make this joke already. Go out and take your kids and your wife out to eat. 
And you could go camping because you get to have good food and good family in a tent. But um, it's a tough time, not just because it's a pandemic. There is so many people aiming at the wrong source of joy. And that's why there's so many people that are joyless, so many people that are hurting. They're waiting for joy to arrive in in the wrong things. So some questions uh, before we get started. How can we have joy in the midst of trials? How does gathering as a church uh, help us have joy? And, and that, that's not just joy that's, that's causing us to sing, but a joy to, to live life for, for Jesus Christ. Number three, how can sharing Jesus with others truly make our hearts happy? Well, let's turn without any further ado to our passage, Christmas passage that the Lord has for us is out of Luke. This is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and starting in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great, come on, say it, joy. That will be for all the people. Someone say all. all. That's everyone. That, that's not just the people in this room. That's the people on Facebook Live. That's the people around the world from Tri-Cities to Tokyo to Turkey. That all people would come to know him. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from, from them into heaven, the, the shepherds went back to sleep. No, 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 it says, and the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up all these things pondering them in her heart and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen uh, that had been told them. Let's pray. Friends, uh, in in Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11, it says, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore in you is fullness uh, of joy. Like in him, we can have fullness of joy. Like you need to know that and believe that, that, that Jesus, in him, there is fullness of joy. And that's our thesis. That's our main idea. Because there is fullness of joy in Christ, we can move from joyless to joyful by gathering to worship Jesus, going to share Jesus, and growing to glorify Jesus. These are the three G's that, of, of joy gathering, going, and then growing to glorify Jesus. Well, let, let's look at this first part of the goal uh, in, in experiencing joy. This, this one is gathering to worship Jesus. And we see it in the text, uh, Luke 2, 13 through 14, and suddenly there was with the angel. So it starts out singular. There's just one angel. And then a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. There is something incredible that happens when we gather. I was thinking about, uh, and and worship, right? Not just gather, but actually worship. I was thinking about the story in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas have been in prison for for going and and sharing uh, their faith and and actually casting a demon out of a girl. And so they're, they're jailed for that. And what do they do? Do they whine? No, they worship and their chains come off and the people around them, their chains come off. Some of us, we think, oh, I'm just gonna go for me. Man, there is something encouraging that happens. 
Like to see some of your faces, to see my friend Ben leading worship and, 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 and David and, and, and in the, actually the Reeser family helping with Advent. And it, like there's something contagious when, about worship when we come together and we hear others singing, our souls are sparked and ignited to sing out and praise Jesus and to worship him, not just when we gather, but when we go for his sake. But some of us remain in isolation. Some of us, we, we, we only see uh, gathering as a Sunday thing. We need to be gathering uh, when we meet under the table uh, to, uh, with our family, when we, when we gather at the table that we're, we're worshiping and praising and not just like eating. <laughs> Look at this again. And the angel said to them, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. What I love about this worship is it starts with one angel and there's a, there's a vast array and a multitude and the response isn't just one shepherd get it, getting excited, but all of them responding collectively to worship. And as you can see, this verse talks about it's for all people. In fact, are you thinking about some, some, some friends that need to be here that you need to invite to, to gather on Christmas Eve at one of our services where you're like, man, it's awesome to gather, but there's some people that are missing out on, on the songs of praise and their hearts being sparked and ignited to praise and know Jesus more. To become, to become the gathered home. To, the, the church is to be the gathered home, to be the gathered church. For us, making it a priority to, on Sunday to gather and worship should not be a religious obligation, but our soul's desperation. Like, man, I, I'm excited to, to sharpen one another, to, to spur one another on, to, to sing out and praise and to hear the chorus of God's church burning bright in song, in praise, and in worship through God's word, through song, in worship, through repentance and response. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is it's not something just for us individually, but it's, there's something for us to be the people of God, the gathered home that we'd gather together. To remind you, Advent means arrival, and it's for all. It says it in the text, it's for all of us. And in this pandemic, more than ever, the, the enemy wants us just isolated and alone. He doesn't want us gathering. Many of us are waiting for our Christmas presents to arrive. Some of you are starting to sweat, right? I mean, let's be honest. You're like, man, those Amazon orders, why are they taking so long? What's going on? Some of your order, like it's weird. Like you haven't even, you just barely hit send and then there's a knock at the door. You're like, that was fast. <laughs> and a little creepy. <laughs> but some of you are, you're waiting with anticipation to gather around the Christmas tree and like share presents and all that. Or some of you are gathering, to, you know, to gather with that sweet honey of yours, that sweet someone to gather under the mistletoe, right? Just remember, sorry, I made it awkward, but just remember the, the, the greatest Christmas gift arrived 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem so that we can gather at the, as the glorious bride of Christ in glorious adoration of Christ. To remind you, here's some theology for you, um, and, and I hope you don't just listen to theology about God, but he, you experience transformation from it. Now, it's not just information, but transformation. The Son of God has always existed. You're like, well, wait a minute. He had a birth at Bethlehem. It says back in Genesis, the Spirit hovered over the waters. And then it tells us later uh, that in him, like he, he spoke life into existence. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that same son of God is the one that took on flesh. And we see uh, his, his interesting entrance into humanity, right? It's very interesting. It's not a packed out Carnegie Hall, but a, a barnyard full of animals that are just wanting to get some warmth. They don't really realize what they're in there. They're, they're at the first ever worship service with, with Jesus, right? In the cradle. And so you have a, a barnyard just basically filled. It was probably a cave, but, but filled with barn animals. And then some curious shepherds. I mean, that's a little creepy. Like, what are these guys doing here? And they're curious, okay. But for the first ever worship service of Christ, 
on earth. His goal was not a glorious entrance, but a glorious presence in our hearts, in our souls. And Jesus knows that worship of him causes us for our, our souls to be satisfied. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. And so some of you are sitting here and you're satisfied and that's great, but there's some others that, that are missing out. I had the privilege of pastoring a memorial service two days ago. So I'm at a funeral, right? And I got to see individuals walking in, hurting, desperately hurting. Over, over a man that, that, that was taken far too early, 42 years old. And, and there's individuals hurting. But those individuals that were hurting, because they gathered, there was something powerful. The spirit moved in that gathering. I want you, come on, track with me. Individuals, singular, coming in, they're hurting. But there was something that the spirit did that sparked in the gathering that turned into healing for some. Healing. And the message of the gospel was preached and, and, and hearts hopefully heard God's word does not return void. There's some, whether it's a funeral, whether it's a wedding, whether it's Sunday morning, we gather to praise Jesus. I want, I want to share with you uh, that we had a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to gather outside of, of the, life, the Richland Life Care Center and and, and sometimes when, when, when you're like, okay, we're, we're going to go in the middle of the day, and the devil doesn't like that, right? And we're, we're all dressed up and gussied up and, uh, and gotten in an intense moment of fellowship with my wife. And so we're like, maybe some Christmas music will help. Does Christmas music help the fight? No, it does not. So we prayed, and I'll tell you what, when we came back together as a family after singing some Christmas carols to some individuals that were hurting so much, our hearts were ignited. There was so much unity in the family. Some of you are like, oh, they got in a fight. How many of you got in a fight on the way here? Come on. No, don't raise your hands. That'd be weird. <laughs> Honey, put it down. Put it down. Anyway, but <laughs> some of you are like, this is not funny. <laughs> How did he know? <laughs> we can do more together and enjoy worship together. Like whether it's a, at a funeral or, a, or a, a wedding or a Sunday or a... Or, or going and, and, and singing, caroling. Like it was so, sp like, I, I gotta be honest. Like it was, I was like, oh, it's cold. I, 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 I. And my wife's like, it's 58 degrees on. I'm like, oh, that's right. I need to be tough. But, and, and, and then I heard that like, and then I heard that, that the, the, we weren't, you know, I, I thought we were gonna be able to sing in the foyer or something. It's like, no, we're singing outside. And, and um, Jared Leedy, a friend of mine, brought uh, a speaker to be able to play, play it loud and, and they actually opened the windows a little bit and, and we sang, but to see these individuals that were hurting and alone, just, they, they were trying to do sign language that, you know, to say, we you know, love you and um, they loved my four-year-old, they just adored her. Um, it, it, it was awesome. It was encouraging to see their hearts leap for joy. There's something powerful when we're faithful to gather that's contagious. It begins to work. Yet many of us, we aim at the wrong thing. Christmas consumerism and sentimentalism doesn't fulfill our deep longings for joy. In fact, the more you take and the more you lean on sentimentalism and the warm fuzzies and the, these memories and this and that and I, I gotta have and I gotta have, it only ravages and hurts you more. It doesn't mean we throw out the eggnog and the mistletoe and and die hard, or you know, whatever it is that we have, it just means we need to aim at Jesus as our main aim for joy. Amen? Amen. Right. And again, this should, gathering on Sunday should not be a religious obligation, but our soul's desperation, like, man, I, I'm looking forward. Sunday's coming. I can't wait to gather, to be spurred on, to be encouraged. We can be joyful knowing Every day, we can worship and praise him that through faith in his gospel, his joy has arrived to our, he's the joy of our salvation. The problem is we live in a fallen world where everyone and everything is corrupted by sin. Sin misdirects us from aiming at joy and we find ourselves very quickly in isolation. 
This is why the world needs the message of Christ to not just be mailed in a Christmas card, not just sung in a Christmas carol, but lived out. Come on, lived out as we seek going to share Jesus. Now, the first point was gathering, gathering to worship Jesus. And the the second point, our second goal is to go. Man, some of us think, man, you know what? Discipleship is, you know, just sitting at one of the pastors, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to message or email Pastor Chad or Pastor Josh and I'm going to meet them on Mondays and, and I'm going to be discipled. So, sometimes discipleship and evangelism go hand in hand and sometimes there's growing as you're going. Like, let, come on, come along. We're, we're going we're gonna to reach out to the neighbors. or Man, come caroling. Like, let, let's go. Going is huge. And we see this happen in the, in the Christmas story, Luke chapter two and verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, it doesn't say the shepherds went back to Netflix. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And what is amazing is these shepherds were motivated to go to meet Jesus because the worship was contagious. They saw a host of angels praising God and it was contagious. And they wanted to go. They wanted to go and experience what these angels were talking about. They're like, man, we gotta see this thing. And so they decided to go. And what's amazing is these, after meeting Jesus in Bethlehem, it turned them into missionaries. They'd never gone to seminary. They didn't have vacation Bible school. They didn't have any of that. And yet the little that was taught to them was caught in their heart and they had to go. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing someone that just has barely met Jesus. They only know a few verses and they're like, man, let's go. This is awesome. And then how in the world is there there people that have known Jesus for year after year, for years, and yet are fine with sitting on the bench? This life is so short. I was humbled seeing a 42-year-old man um, finish the race. And I'll tell you what, he finished strong for Jesus. I was so proud. I mean, it, Jesus was alive in this man. But it was hum- tomorrow's not promised. As long as we have breath in our lungs, will we go and be the people of God that have joy for Jesus so that others can experience his joy. And again, going to share Jesus can actually help you grow in joy. And that leads us to our last point. Again, our goal today is because there's fullness of joy in Christ, we can move from joyless to joyful by growing. So not just gathering, not just going, but growing in glorifying Jesus. We see this in verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things things, pondering them in her heart. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your what? Heart. So we need to ponder. We need to think about these things. In fact, Acts chapter two, verses 41 through 48, it talks about, and they, the apostles, they, they devoted themselves. The early church, they met, they gathered, not just on Sunday, they gathered, they they gathered together and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They're pondering, they're thinking, they're meditating. It's not just a flash of emotion and listening to a sermon on a Sunday, but they're thinking, meditating on the things of God. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. A, a, A generous heart, a generous spirit, is a joyous spirit. Don't be a miser, don't be a bah humbug. It's just like, well, I'm going to just hoard and I'm just going to. And some of us, we look at our, our, our calendar. What do we have left over? Do we have any leftovers in our calendar? Or, or with our giving, God doesn't want, uh, he doesn't want leftovers. He doesn't even want second place. He wants first, your first fruits. Are you giving him first? And, and you're thinking. You are what you think about, right? Like what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about him and choosing joy? Our joy in Jesus is indestructible, but sadly, misplaceable. 
We forget him. I, if Paul David Tripp talks about that, that identity amnesia. We forget who we are, the new identity that we have. We were uh, in, in, in Richland doing a little bit of Christmas shopping after the caroling and, and um, what is the name of the antique store? I just forgot. It's not Sunken Treasures. What's the other one? Hunt and Gather. Hunt and Gather. Great place. They have a phone booth. And I, and I thought of buying it so Chad could, could uh, show you the Clark Kent getting into the phone booth and the new identity and be Superman, have the cape, but, but Chad refuses to wear a cape, so we didn't buy a phone booth. But anyways, you get the point, like, we're hidden in Christ. He's the real Superman, like, and yet why are we not, we don't, we don't see anything supernatural in our life, we're just the mild-mannered Clark Kent where we don't see God's power because we're not doing anything that expects power. The joy in Jesus is indestructible but sadly misplaceable. God wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to grow in our going. He wants us to grow in our giving. He wants us to, our joy to grow. We're wired for worship. We're wired to have joy in him. I wanna share something and maybe write this down. As long as sin still lives in you, you will need to be rescued from you. As long as sin still lives in you, you will need to be rescued from you. In fact, as I was about to preach at the funeral, I was, I was thinking to myself, oh man, how many people need to hear the gospel? How many people? And then I'm reminded, oh yeah, I need to hear the gospel daily. I need to be rescued daily. I need to die to self and ri- crawl out of bed to crawl under the cross. You guys, you keep hearing that. Oh, he keeps repeating himself. Why does he do that? Because we, it's sadly misplaceable. We get identity amnesia. We forget our need for him. We need rescuing. We need to grow. Not to show off, oh, look what I can do. Look at how smart I am. Look at all the Bible verses I've memorized. I'm so amazing. No, to enjoy him, to have a joy that all the fullness of joy is in him. It's so great that we can lose our temper and yet we we don't lose our salvation. (laughs) I got a story to tell you guys about that. Uh, It's about bacon. Um, Some of you already are like, oh, I can relate. If it went wrong with the bacon, relate. (laughs) In fact, I have a saying about bacon. Either you like bacon or you're wrong. Okay, so anyways, um, on Saturday mornings at the Pasma house, um, actually Vaughn is a great sous chef. I mean, that, that guy can, can flip pancakes like nobody's business. And I've, I've taught the kids how, you know, I, daddy sets the timer and we're gonna, if you hear that go off and all that. Well, on one of those days, I'm not very proud of this, I went back upstairs and, fell back asleep, okay? I fell back asleep. But the timer was set. And so I'm like, you know, it'll be okay. It was not. I came down to burnt bacon. And so those kids got a little burnt from daddy. I was a little cranky. And uh, I'm like, kids, the timer went off. And they're like, oh, we know we turned it off. But, did, but there's a little bit more than just turning it off. And uh, yeah, I got, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a happy camper. And I, and I tried to blame them. I tried to push the blame on them instead of taking responsibility. Like I could have fallen asleep on the couch, not upstairs, no. <laughs> but here's the deal. My transparency is not meant for you to just go, oh, I can relate. Especially if the bacon got burnt. I can definitely relate to that, right? But you need to know this, that, that your Your transparency can bring about transformation with others. Be real, be open. Because some of us, we just want to get our Bibles, we want to open them up and not ever open up our heart. Boy, we know the Bible, but we don't know the the other people around us. We don't know their stories. We know God's story, but we don't know the stories of our neighbors. We don't know the stories of how people need sharpened and and we don't have, and we're like, oh, I just don't understand why they won't open up and you won't open up and you're really closed off. And then you look at yourself and you're like, Oh, I haven't been transparent. I need to open up. We see the Bible and we see so many people opening up. Like the disciples sleeping. You know, like, like the, uh, as, as, as Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. He's now moved from the cradle to, now he's getting ready to go to the cross. And he asks his disciples to stay awake. And they sleep. Sleep. 
We need to be, some of our growing needs to happen from transparency and opening up and being real so we can spur one another on and sharpen one another. I want to share this. At Christ's birth, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and at his death, he was wrapped in burial clothes. Well, what's the point of this? The point is the clothes wouldn't define him. In his actual, it's his actual glorious resurrection that brings about new birth for us. He's our source of joy. He's the persona of joy. He's the reason for joy. And we need to grow in this reality. Grow in this undeserved grace Romans 5, 2, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Joy doesn't ignore grief and sorrow. It is what helps us navigate it to learn to heal and grow during it. I want to tell you, the, uh, I got, got a chance to meet with the, the, the widow and the family uh, and this last week, for hours, actually, they become dear friends. Um, and I, I loved it. One of the family members is like, man, I want to be, be a part of the church. I want to be a part of life group. I want, and it was so exciting to see people that even though they're in the midst of despair and hurting, they want to grow. They're hungry. It was absolutely so encouraging. Joy is a natural response when things are good. It's an adopted response that takes growth and discipleship when, when things are not. I'll say it again. Joy does not ignore grief and sorrow. It is what helps us navigate it and learn to heal and grow in it. To choose joy. In fact, there's a command for joy in James chapter one. It says, count it all joy. It doesn't say like, hey, you should think about being joyful. Ah, if you feel like it. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And Paul knew what it was like to be at sea in a boat and, and to have the wind, uh, you know, to have no sail and to be tattered and have no anchor, but then to find Jesus, to be the lifeboat, that when the waves hit and the tide hits and the storms hit, to have your anchor and to have the, the, the spirit of God be the wind for your sail. Paul knew that firsthand and he knew, man, come on, count it all joy when the storms come. Knowing it grows our faith. Knowing it grows. Someone say grows. Do you want to grow? Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, looking at Jesus, looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And then John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you that, and that your joy may be full. And finally, Psalm 16, 11, I'll say it again. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Some people think following Jesus means no more joy, no more pleasure. In fact, we think, oh, the devil, he's all about pleasure. Really? Satan has created zilch. He's a perverter. He takes all the good pleasure, like the bread. It, Jesus is the bread of life. I mean, worship. I mean, this is, we're to experience pleasure and joy in him. In him is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's in the Bible to experience real pleasure. And some of you still are like, oh, church and Christianity, that, that means no more fun and no more pleasure. Not pleasure, the fleeting pleasures of this world, but the joy and pleasure that is found in our soul's satisfaction in knowing Him. I want you to grow. God wants you to grow. Fill out a connection card right now, a digital connection card. You can go to the, the app or crossfitcommunity.com and you'll, you'll see the connect part. It's super easy. But if you have any trouble filling out a connection card, send all of your emails to Pastor Chad, and, <laughs> but he'll get you taken care of on that. Um, or our office, actually. <laughs> but if you would, let's, let's go ahead and stand and let's pray.